Mishlei, the book of Mishlei, when the Pesukim talk about bread and wine in various contexts, uh, the Vilna Gaon says that the halachic portions of Torah are compared to bread. They give you your basic uh, nutrition, and the mystical and agadic portions of Torah are compared to wine that give you an internal simcha. And so lechem v'yayin. Uh, and therefore, when you look at the Psukim in Mishle, Lechem and Yayin, they are, the Gra always says, they are references to Halacha versus Agada and the like. When I say Halacha, you understand, I don't mean Halacha Lemaisa, I mean the Halachic discussions of the Gemara, even if it doesn't give you Halacha Lemaisa. Now, where do you find Agadita? So obviously you find Agadita in the Bavli and you find Agadita in the Yushalmi. But we also have other books that are called Midrashim. And we talked about there are two types of midrashim. Um, there are midrashe halacha, which give you drashos on psukim, based on the yud gimel midas, and uh, they are halachic midrashim, and they are really brisos. They are teachings of the tanaim that are not in the mishnah. And often, when the gemara says tanya, we learn in a brisa, it actually is a reference to either the tosefta or a reference to the Midrashe Halacha. Uh, there is no Medrash Halacha and Breshis, because there's very little Halacha and Breshis. Uh, the Medrash Halacha and Shmos is Mechilta. The Medrash Halacha and Sefer Vayikra is called Sifra. And the Medrash Halacha and Bamidbar and Devorim is called Sifri. Uh, you will notice when you learn Rashi and Chumash, that often after something is stated, particularly in this week's part of Mishpatim, you will see a parenthesis that says Mechilta, or Sifri, or Sifra. Uh, Rashi did not put those in. Those were put in actually by uh, later printers and editors, but they are telling you the source of where Rashi got his statement. Other times Rashi got his statement from a Gemara, and other times Rashi is Mechadesh, right? So there are different sources. Every line in Rashi uh, will have some type of source, uh, in fact, people sometimes say, what's so great about Rashi? All Rashi does is Rashi anthologizes from Gemara, Yubavli, Yushalmi, and Medrash Halacha, and Medrash Agada, when it says Beis Resh, that's Beresh's Rab, etc. So what's Rashi's greatness? Well, part of, part of Rashi's greatness is that uh, Rashi chooses which Midrashim he wants to teach you. Now, if you open up a Medrash, you'll see huge amounts of material. And there's a tremendous chachma. We have to go through each pasuk would be different. Why Rashi chose that medrash rather than another medrash? So the choosing of midrashim in terms of wanting to communicate certain lessons is in itself a great chachma. And the commentaries on Rashi, you know, there are more than 300 commentaries on Rashi. 300 perushim on Rashi ala Torah. Uh, the greatest is Rabbi Yom Mizrahi. Uh, and then you have the Lavush, and then you have uh, the Maral, the Gorarye, then you have the Sifse Chachamim, but those are only four out of 300. There's another 296 uh, Perushim on Rashi, and the Meforshim on Rashi go over that type of issue. Why did Rashi choose this Medrash uh, versus that Medrash? So the Medrash Halacha are sources of Halacha, whether it's, again, as I say, whether it's Mechilta, uh, Sifra, or Sifri. Those are halachic midrashim. However, we have other midrashim that are almost 100% agada, and they are called midrashe agada. And there, there are many, 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 a number of which we've lost, we don't even have anymore. We only know them because they're mentioned by Rishonim. Uh, but the midrashim are largely uh, tanoim, but there's also a moraim, meaning the midrashe halacha are only tanoim. In fact, the Medrashe Halacha are earlier than the, the Mishnah. The Medrashe Agada have Tanoim and Amarayim, the same types of people you'll see in the Gemara itself. And the most famous authoritative Medrash of Chazal is called the Medrash Rabbah. And the Medrash Rabbah is not on all of Tanakh. It is only on the Chamishe Chumshe Torah and the five Megillas. So the way we refer to it is we talk about Bereshis Rabbah, Shmos Rabbah, Bayikra Rabbah, Bamidbar Rabbah, Devarim Rabbah, Esther Rabba, Rus Rabba, Eicha Rabba, Shira Shirim Rabba, Kahelis Rabba. I think I got all the Megillus. I don't know. Okay, whatever it is. Uh, that's called the Medrash Rabba. And uh, even Art Scroll has started. I uh, started. I think they're almost finished. They've, uh, they've done their, their Art Scroll on the Medrash Rabba. Uh, the next Medrash uh, in authority is the Medrash Tanchuma. 
called so called because it was compiled by an Amira Rav Tanchuma. Uh, then we have Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer from Rabbi Eliezer uh, Ben Horkinus. And then we have Pesikta. Uh, there's two Pesiktas. There's Pesikta Rabasi, which is the larger Pesikta, and Pesikta. It's a Rav Kahana. These are two different Midrashim. Again, Rav Kahana was the Amira that was Masadir, uh, these different teachings. A lot of it is from Tanoim, but again, once again, these were Baalpeh, and he was Maasef, and he gathered it. Uh, those are, I would say, uh, the, author the most authoritative Midrashim that we know that come from Chazal. Medrash Rabbah, Medrash Tanchuma, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, Pisikta Rabasi, and Pesikta to Rav Kahana. Yeah. Does the Midrashim are included in this like Isser of like writing down Torah Shabbat? So it's interesting. Uh, it's mashma that the Isser of writing down Torah Shabbat may have only applied to Halachos and not Agadita. As Agadita seems to have been allowed to be written down even at an earlier time. Uh, but it was not always written down. Uh, and therefore, in other words, it was not a problem of an issue, but Lemaisa things were not written down. They were like drushos mm -hmm. that people did not necessarily feel a need to write down. Yeah, but but, but it would not be Nichlal in the issue of writing down Tyresha Balpa. Midrash Halacha, that was written before the time. So it, that's a little complicated. The Rambam is Mashma in the Hakdama mm -hmm. that the Midrash Halacha was written down before, I'm sorry, after the Mishnah. But it represents drushos that are earlier than the Mishnah. Because after all, if you look at a Midrash Halacha, you're going to see a Machlokas, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfan. Now obviously, the Machlokas, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfan, must have been earlier than the Mishnah because Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfan were earlier than the Mishnah, right? right. So it may be, the Rambam is mashma, it was not written down until then, but nevertheless it represents a Torah Shabal Peh that predated the writing of the Mishnah. And in fact, as I say, uh, you see from the Gemara that the Midrashe Halacha are often the source for why the Mishnah says a certain thing. Again, you understand this. this is, Tosefta is the same thing. The Tosefta as a book was written down after the Mishnah. But the Teichen of the Tosefta is all earlier than the Mishnah because it represents all of the different Machloksim that Rivia Nasi drew upon. So the Tosefta was almost like the at least in an oral way, was almost like the raw material from which Rav Yudah Hanasi wrote, wrote the Mishnah. So all Brises, not all, but most Brises are either Tosefta or Midrash Halacha. Now, one thing about Midrash Agada is that the Midrash Agada were written at different times. In Bereshit, you know, there was different Midrashim were written at different times, although they are from the Tanoim and the Amarayim. And as a result, there are uh, midrashim that are after the Mishnah and even after the Gemara, so which in which the Medrash takes from the Gemara, and there are midrashim that are the opposite that are earlier than the Gemara, right? So sometimes you'll find midrashim that overlap with Gemara, the Agadat in Gemara, and the question is, did the Medrash take it from Gemara? Or did the Gemara take it from the Medrash? Uh, each Medrash is different. And again, uh, uh, one of the Gedolim who wrote about this was very interested in these questions. You might know from the back of the Gemaras, um, Maritz Chios. Maritz Chios was Rav Tzvi uh, Chios. He was a Rav in Galicia. It's like in the back of, uh, of a Shas that has Meforshim. You'll see on every Masechta, although in the new Ozvahadu you don't have that anymore because they consolidate Meforshim, but in the old-fashioned Shasan that had this parish, that parish, that parish, that parish, although that was very cumbersome, I like the new way of combining the Meforshim. But uh, next to the Rishash, you would have uh, Maritz Chios. Now, Maritz Chios is really one of the most interesting, if we could use the word, Gedolim of the 19th century. He was a Gadol Betora, a Bucky in Shas and Paiskim, one of the Paiskim of the generation, etc. But he was very, very interested in historical questions. Like, when was this Medrash written? Uh, and, and all of the issues of Torah Shabbat. In fact, uh, he wrote a Sefer, which is translated in English, and it's still Kedai to look at, called Mavoha Talmud, which is an introduction to, to the Talmud. And I think it's been translated, I think it's called A Student's Introduction to the Talmud, Maritz Chiyos. Uh, you can get it in English, you can read it in Hebrew, and it really is one of the best introductions. A lot of what I talk about is, is kind of based on the ideas of Maritz Chiyos. 
and he was very, very interested in historical issues. And he writes about when this medrash was written, which medrash takes from the Gemara, which, when does the Gemara take from the, from the medrash, and every medrash is different. You can't, even the medrash rabba, every book is a different, a different type of, date. again, it's not, unless you're into history, it's not that important for us, because again, it is the work of the Tanoim and Amayroim, so Amay Nafkamina, you know, when it was written, but nevertheless, uh, these are interesting issues. Now, let me just mention, um, by the way, because, because Maritz Chies was so interested in history, and this was during the rise of the Haskalah movement. There was a constant accusation against him that he was a closet Moscow because he was interested in those things. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Rebetzin David is a very, very prominent uh, Menahelet here in Yerushalayim, and she is the daughter of Rav Hutner, Zechrono Levracha. So she actually has a doctorate uh, in Jewish studies from, I think, NYU or Columbia, Columbia University. And she wrote her doctoral dissertation on the Maritz a very, very brilliant, uh, brilliant woman. And so she goes through all of these different ideas, and that's how she got her PhD. Uh, yeah? Um, did, um, is there a Mesora for also, like, the also? Because a lot of the, a lot of the Agadahs that come up in the Gemara are, are, are stories that happen to the time and the Marayim. So they used to, like, where, so where are those, where, where, like, where is the Agadah coming from? Well, again, uh, going with the Rambam's Yisai that we talked about, uh, the uh, all Agada uh, does convey spiritual ideas, and the spiritual ideas are part of Torah, and they were even given to Moshe at Sinai, and they are Kaddish, but the particular form that the Chachamim embodied the teaching in a parable, in a story, in a Misa, uh, is Lavdafka literal, and it may be symbolic. Uh, and if they tell stories about Rabbi Akiva, even if they're true, they're not like given to Moshe Misenai. They are what the Chachamim knew. The Chachamim knew Rabbi Akiva, and they preserved stories about Rabbi Akiva. So the idea of Messiah, Messiah and Agadita, has to be understood uh, not in his literal way. Uh, Hashem gave them a story to tan down from generation to generation. Number one, it means the teaching, the spiritual message was given to Moshe Misenai in terms of ethics, in terms of values. And number two, things that are biographical in nature by definition came later. I mean, the stories that happened of how Rabbi Akiva died, we can believe that's, li that's literal. There's no reason to deny that, that Rabbi Akiva was tortured to death and he accepted it with joy. I mean, that's not a, you know, that's not a Misa, that's, a, that's it's not above a Misa, that's a true story. But that wasn't, you know, that, that was because they knew, the Chachamim knew, this is what happened to, uh, to uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva. Uh, so again, uh, remember the Rambam's Yisait, all of these Midrashim are emes, but the emes may or may not be literal. It's not always going to be the case. Now, there is a Sefer, which is a very, very important source of Midrashim, called Yalkut Shemaini. Now, Yalkut Shemaini is very, very special for the following reason. It consists of Midrashim not only on the Chumash and the Megillus, but on every single Sefer of Nach. So if you wanted to know what do Chazal say in the book of Yoshua, the book of Malachim, the book of Yirmiyahu, almost the only Medrash I could send you to would be the Yalkut Shemaini. It's on everything. It's every safer of, 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 of Nach. But what's interesting is, in spite of that, Tehillim, for example. There's, uh, uh, well, okay, well, Tehillim is a little different. Okay, but the Yalkut on Tehillim. Although Tehillim had, does have another Medrash. What is a little unusual about the Yalkut is that the Yalkut is technically not a Medrash. It is an anthology of Midrashim that was compiled in the days of the Rishonim. The Masader of the Yalkut Shemaini was a man, Rav Shimon, Rabbi Shimon, who was the Darshan in Frankfurt, Germany. And he lived uh, a little before Rashi. And what he did was, he decided to be Malachi, because see, there are many Midrashim, and he took from all the Midrashim and the Gemaras, and the Gemaras as well, uh, all, all that was Shaykh to every Pasuk in Tanakh. So if you look at uh, the Pasuk Aleph of Bereshis, 
He'll bring Bavli, Yerushalmi, Tosefta. It's a uh, uh, He'll bring uh, the, uh, the Medrash Rabbah, the Medrash Tanchuma. Right? Everything. So, on one hand, the Yalkut is not Machadish anything. It's not a new Medrash. The Yalkut is an anthology of existing Midrashim. But there are two ways in which the Yalkut is extremely important. Number one, the Yalkut was malakate on all of Nach. So, for example, let's, let's take the Medrash Bracious Rabbah. That's the Medrash on Bracious. Now, there is no Medrash on the Book of Shmuel. But in the middle of the Medrash Rav of Bracious, there'll be Psukim of Shmuel that are going to be explained. So it's in there, but it's not on the book of Shmuel. So the Yalkut went through everything and pulled out the Shmuel Midrashim and put them on Shmuel, pulled out the Malachim Midrashim, put them on Malachim. So even though everything is taken from an existing, a pre-existing Medrash, but the pre-existing Medrash was not organized uh, along the lines of each safer, and the Yalkut organizes it along the lines of each safer. That's why it's enormously important. I mean, how am I going to find what Chazal said about uh, the book of Shmuel if there is no Medrash on the book of Shmuel? Right? So, it's, so you know, so if I'm Rav Chaim Kineski, I just know all the Midrashim, I know all Shas, so I automatically know it. But most of us are not going to know it. Right? So, in a sense, the Yalkut Shemani can function as an index to all of these midrashim arranged according to the Seder. That's one great mila of the Yalkut. The second great mila is even more important. And even Rav Chaim Kineski would need this one. And that is, the Yalkut apparently had access to many midrashim that we do not even have. Meaning to say, there are many midrashim. Why they got lost, it's hard to know. But there are many midrashim that we only know from the Yalkut Shemaini. So if you take out a Yalka Tremaini, you will see that usually there are footnotes. In other words, everything is given a source. You know, this is from Gemara Kedushin. This is from Yushalmi Brachos. This is from Bereshus Rabbah. This is from Shemos Rabbah. This is from Tosefta Edges. And sometimes it will say, Medrish Hanelam, which actually means a Medrish that we have lost. And that's extremely important because the truth of the matter is, there are Midrashim that we only know via the Yalkut Shimoni, that even though the Yalkut Shimoni itself is not a Midrash, meaning it was written, not written, it was compiled by one of the Rishonim, but it is based on Gemara and Midrash, and everything there is from the Tanoim and Amorayim. So that's why you'll find often uh, that many, many Meforshim will often quote Midrashim from the Yalkut more than they will quote even the Midrash Rabbah, because the Yalkut is where they went to look at these midrashim. Yeah. How are they considered lost if he found them? No, no, what I'm saying is they got lost after his time, meaning to say, uh, w remember, you have to know that before the uh, age of printing, printing was not invented, I think, until around 1450s, around then. Now, the Yalkut, Bala Yalkut, is living in the, uh, the, uh, the 11th century, the 10 hundreds. So in those days, every single cipher had to be copied by hand, manuscripts. And what happened was there weren't that, that many manuscripts around and sometimes things got lost. It's hard, it's hard to know exactly. But I mentioned that in the Rambam himself, he's Marami, something was lost. The Rambam says there's a Talmud Yerushalmi on five orders of the Mishnah. Remember, we talked about that. Now, the truth is we don't have a Talmud Yerushalmi on five orders. We have it on Zerayim. We have it on Moed. We have it on Nashim. Uh, we have it on, on uh, Nezikin. Uh, so that's four orders. Uh, and the Rambam says there was a Yerushalmi on the order of Kodshim, and we don't have that. Totally lost. I, I gave you the story about a forger, who, a rabbi who actually made up a Gemara, and people thought this was a new Yerushalmi. It turned out to be fake. And so we don't have a Yerushalmi on Kodshim. We don't have it. And yet the Rambam was made. There is a Talmud Yerushalmi on Kodshim. So what happened? It got lost. How do you lose a Gemara? You know, how, how does that happen? Wow. I mean, imagine I give you the only manuscript of, of, of shots, you know, to watch. <laughs> I come back half an hour and say, sorry, I just put it down and it, you know, it disappeared. You know, how, how does it disappear? But, but somehow, unfortunately, we have a history of that. I think the Yushalmi maybe is the greatest example, but time of a common midrashim were lost. Now, one, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. So, um, 
there used to be specific sparm of the Russian for Navi as well, and then also are there other yeah. major categories that we know for sure are missing, like uh, Midrash on Agadita or... So were there, were there separate Midrashic compilations on other books of Nachman? On the five Megillus, there always were, right? Five Megillus are Med Medrash Rabbah. On the other Sfarim, so I should say, we do have a Medrash, that's why I misspoke a, a few moments ago, on Tehillim. We do have a separate Medrash of Chazal on Tehillim, and that is called Medrash Shochar Tov. The, the only reason it's called that is because uh, there's a Pusik that says, Shochar Tov, a good intercessor. That's just the first Pusik that's interpreted in the Medrash, so it's known by the first words. So Medrash Shochar Tov is the Medrash of Chazal on Tehillim. And there's a Medrash on Mishle, Proverbs, that is called Medrash Chazisa, which is, again, just because it's the first word of a Pusik that's being darshaned. So when you see the words, and you'll see it in commentaries and Svarim, Medrash Shochar Tov, Medrash Chazisa, that is a Medrash of the Tanoim on Tehillim and on Mishle. On the other Sfarim, uh, it's sporadic. Some have said there's a Medrash on Shmuel. We're not entirely clear or clear of those things and the like. But certainly, if you want to, you know, do we know of a Medrash on Sefer Malachim, Sefer Yermio, Sefer Yeshayo? As far as I know, we don't, we don't have it. And the only way we really access the Midrashim is via the Yalkut Shimoni. And that's, uh, that's why the Yalkut is a very, very important uh, sefer. Ad Kach, that the Mugin Avram, the Mugin Avram is one of the greatest, greatest poskim. On the Shulchan Aruch, Arachayim, the main parish on Shulchan Aruch, Arachayim, is the Mugin Avram. Right? The Mishnah Burra brings the Mugin Avram like every other line. Right? Extremely, extremely a great, great posek. And the Mugin Avram wrote one other sefer, he wrote a parish on the Yalkut Shimoni. Uh, so, Magin Avram and on the Halacha, and the Yal parish on the Yalkut Shimoni in Agadita, and in uh, many editions of the Yalkut, they, they still print the Magin Avram's parish. Yeah. If we're not talking about halachic matters or anything, you know, say Darshaning from Abbasu, why are like Rishonim, so to speak, not able to make on their own Midrashim Arvin, like? Yeah, so the short answer is they do, uh, but they don't, call, they don't call it Medrash. In other words, we don't use the word Medrash because uh, that's a little disrespectful because that was used by the Tanoim and Amorim. But, I mean, think about this. The Kliokor, I mean, before Shaman Chumash will often offer Agadic, what we call Agadita explanations based on their understanding of the Torah. So uh, we wouldn't talk this way because it's not respectful, but in a sense, the idea of Medrash Agada is something that uh, people do even today when they have a drasha and a pasuk. Now, now you want to be sure it doesn't contradict what Chazal say, things like that. But people have chidushim, people have ha'oros, and that is really what Medrash was. Again, uh, let, let me emphasize this, because I know it sometimes disturbs people because I'm saying Medrashim are made up. They're made up only in the limited sense that the particular form and the way it's expressed is a function of the person's individual personality and knowledge and the like. But the shayrish, the core of the truth, is a chalik of Torah. Right? And that's why you have to be careful that if you're saying something, is it MS, you know, in other words, is it expressing a Torah value or are you being influenced by a secular value? That's always going to be a difficult problem. But that process of medrash just still goes on in a sense. Uh, again, we don't call it a medrash, but I will tell you this, there are midrashim that go by the name medrash that in fact are not midrashim at all. For example, uh, one of the great commentaries on the Torah, this is a direct answer to you, is Rabbeinu Bachaya, or some people pronounce it Bachya. Right? Rabbeinu Bachaya is one of the great, great, great meforshim on the Torah. It's, uh, now if you look, if you ever look at it, the official name of the Sefer is medrash Rabbi Bechaya. So it was called Medrash. I mean, the, the Rishayim called, sometimes called their commentaries, or at least people who printed it called their commentaries Medrash. Uh, there's a Medrash Lekach Tov you might come across, which is not from the Tanarim and Amorim. It's from the time of the Gaonim. So the word Medrash was used for other times, because what, what does the word Medrash mean? Medrash just means exposition, explanation. Beis HaMedrash, a place where you explore and investigate things. 
although that's used for halachic investigations, mainly. So, medrash is not a, a copyrighted term, per se, meaning you can use it for anything that you're doing. But as I say, our minog has been in recent uh, centuries that uh, we, we use the Lushan for chazal. We don't want to be mishtamish. See, the Reform Movement likes to say, the Reform Movement always says, uh, the, like I see, they'll give a course in how to create your own medrash. You know, okay. Uh, in truth, that, that is not intrinsically a totally treif idea. I mean, we could call it another thing. How to be machadesh insights in Torah. You know, you can call it that. Okay? But by using the word medrash, there seems to be a little implication that, hey, Chazal do medrash and I do medrash and they're just, they're just as good as each other. And that, that would, would certainly not be, uh, certainly would not be the emiss. Now, uh, in addition to this, as I say, there are many, many lost midrashim and there are many fragmentary midrashim. Some midrashim were lost and they were partially found and they're fragments, pieces, and they've been reprinted in various ways. Uh, some of them are available online, some of them are in specialized uh, collections, uh, fragmentary midrashim that still get, uh, you know, I'm sure many, many of you have heard of the Cairo Geniza. This is a very, very interesting thing that's still going on more, almost uh, 150 years later. A Geniza is simply a place where you put Seamus, right? You have a Seamus, you have Seamus bucks and, and the like. So apparently uh, Cairo, the old show of Cairo, the Rambam show, right? The Rambam was the Rav in Cairo, uh, had a room that had been used for a Geniza for hundreds and hundreds of years before, by the Rambam's time, it was already used for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so let's, fl let's fl uh, go forward to like 18, I don't have the exact date, but let's say 1870. <laughs> 1870, this was a room that had Seamus thrown into it for a thousand years. So nobody, nobody went into that room. That room had been locked for, for centuries. You know, you just, there was a little slit in the wall and people would dump it and eventually, eventually it would r run out of space, but people were just throwing things. So you had Seamus, an accumulation of Seamus like 1,200 years, 1,200 years of Seamus, a big room that nobody ever went into. So uh, in the 18, again, I don't know the exact dates, but in the latter part of the 1800s, there was a fellow who became famous as a conservative rabbi, but, but at that time he was probably uh, mainly orthodox, uh, Salman Schechter. And uh, Shlomo Zalman Schechter was his, his Hebrew name. And he was a historian and the like, and he got access to the Cairo Geniza. And, you know, just imagine this. I mean, it's a little bit like my office. I mean, I have to sit into, you know, 2,000 years of Seamus, you know. And these are like little bits of paper. And, and he worked for years and years and years to get stuff out of the Geniza. And they're still, they're still doing it. They're still finding things in the Cairo Geniza to this day. And it's a whole chachma, really, because you have paper, not or paper or parchment, whatever it was, it's disintegrated into a hundred pieces in this huge mass of stuff. And people have to sit together like jigsaw puzzles and match up pieces. And they find all sorts of things. They find kasubos. They find gitten. They find nuschos of tefillah that we don't do anymore, but these are old nuschos of tefillah. Uh, we find Kesav Yad of the Rambam, actual, the Rambam's own handwriting. All of this was not Seamus, right? And they're still, this is the, well, the Cairo Geniza. So one of the things that you find in the Cairo Geniza is you find some of these lost midrashim. You find uh, fragments, at least, of these lost midrashim that get, uh, get reprinted. Okay, so you'll see often, if you read uh, Svarim, you read introductions, you'll, you'll sometimes see this was a retrieved from the Cairo, Geniza, and it's mamish still going on. It's, it's amazing uh, that after 150 years, they have not yet completed the process. But you can imagine how, how hard it is. Again, I'm not saying you should take off time from learning to go match up jigsaw puzzles, but it is, in a sense, helping, helping learning in the future because they're reconstructing swarm that had been lost. And I mean, not, not, I mean, not everything is so significant. I mean, there'll be recipes there, cookbook. I don't know why a cookbook would be put in Seamus, but you know, there, there, there are divrei chol in the Geniza as, as, as well. Uh, in fact, there's an interesting thing. I think uh, 
there was a letter, just, this is about the Rambam, although it's primarily Jivrei Chal, but it's a fascinating little letter about a man who want, this is from the Cairo Geniza, a man wanted to, to, to bring his son to the Rambam. His son was like 10 years old. And he made a special trip to Cairo, Fustet was the Jewish part of Cairo, to bring him to the Rambam. And no, the Rambam only had one son, his Rambam ben Rambam was a great guttel, who was already a, an adult. And the man says there was so much trepidation, we're going to see the Rambam, the great Rambam. And he comes and he says that Rabbi Ram ben Rambam whispered to the little kids, uh, call my father Saba. He loves when children call him grandpa. <laughs> he whispered to the kid, he said, be sure to, you know, the father, is the father of the child is recounting this. Rabbi Ram ben Rambam was with his father and he whispered to my son and the Rambam like gave him a, a pinch on the cheek and kissed on the cheek and the Rambam gave him a candy from his pocket, like all of these things. And this is from a, a letter. Again, I, it's not Divrei Kodesh, although anything about the Rambam might be Kodesh, but we got that little bit of sense of who the Rambam was, personally, uh, from the letters in the, in the Cairo Geniza. But again, the only reason I'm bringing this up is just to tell you that the Cairo Geniza is also a source of many lost Midrashim uh, that we have, yeah. Uh, were there any notable figures that were living I, I'd have to check because obviously the Geniza was already, as I say, uh, maybe more than a hundred years before uh, the Rambam. So uh, obviously there was a Jewish community uh, in, from the time of the Gainim, but I'll, I'll try to see if I could identify uh, who would be a prominent uh, figure at the, at, at the time. Uh, again, halakhically, let me just remind you, we, we talked about this as well, even though the Torah prohibits living in Eretz Mitzrayim, I can ask a very simple kasha. The Torah says you're not allowed to go back to Mitzrayim. So if you're not allowed to go back to Mitzrayim, how could the Rambam live in Mitzrayim? Now, a tourist, you could say, even that is a shadow, but maybe the Torah only prohibits permanently living there. Okay. So maybe tourism might be mutter, but even if tourism, even if that's going to be mutter, the Rambam lived there, right? How could it be mutter? So the simple shot is that the Torah does not prohibit the land of Egypt. The Torah prohibits living amongst the Egyptian people who enslaved you. Now, the present population of Egypt are not even descended from the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptian nation is extinct. The Egyptians in Egypt now are Arabs. So they're B'nai Yishmael. They're not uh, uh, B'nai Cham, uh, which Mitzrayim is from Cham. So as a result, uh, the hatcher of living in Mitzrayim would be that the Torah doesn't answer the land, the Torah answers dwelling among the population of Mitzrayim. So that's why the Rambam lived there. Rav Ovadja, in more recent times, Rav Ovadja, uh, was born in Yerushalayim, but Rav Ovadja was a Rav in Mitzrayim for several years before he came back. Yeah. Did it go extinct at Kriyas Yamsev? No, it was not extinct in Kriyas Yamsev. Uh, cl clearly it's not extinct because uh, you certainly had uh, the Egyptian uh, empire on some level coming back in the days of the Nevi'im. Yecheskel, Yermio, talk about Mitzrayim. Uh, Mitzrayim waged war against us in the book of Malachim. There were times we fought Mitzrayim and there were Paros and the like. So uh, they were not extinct until really around the Chorban base, uh, Bayes Rishon. Uh, with Nebuchadnezzar, remember, because remember, Nebuchadnezzar, we look at Nebuchadnezzar only in terms of what he did to us, but one has to know Nebuchadnezzar did plenty of havoc throughout the whole world, including the, the destruction of, of Mitzrayim and, and the like. And that's why the Tyrus still had to tell us not to live in Mitzrayim, because there were, uh, even after Kriyas Yamsef, there were still many, many Egyptians uh, in Mitzrayim. Okay, so that's uh, kind of what you need to know about uh, the, the Midrashim. Uh, I mentioned that, that some have a minag, it's brought down in Svar Makadoshim, that Shabbos Kaidish especially is Masugal for the learning of Agadita. Uh, Agadita can take the form of Ein Yaakov, uh, which is actually easier a little bit. It's Gemara, Gemara Agadita for some reason is, is a little easier than Midrashic Agadita for some reason. The Medrash is harder to learn, we're, 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 le we're less used to it and, and the like, but uh, it could be an Ein Yaakov, it could be, uh, it could be a Medrash Rabbah, Medrash Tanchuma. Uh, even the English books, the Medrash says, <laughs> are actually uh, pretty good. I know, actually, I know some Tamarei Chachamim who read the Medrash says every week because they, they want to get a quick overview of what uh, Chazal, Chazal say. 
But again, uh, keep in mind the, the Rambam's Yisait, which is a very big Yisait, that not all Midrashim are meant to be literal. They always have spiritual truth, but they are often symbolic ideas or symbolic ways of expressing very deep uh, spiritual ideas. Okay.